Oh, I mean, I didn't know. Shoot, shoot out again. You can do. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Every possible color. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Every, yeah. Possible, every possible like set of lists has to have a coloring that works. This afternoon's map was a stravaganza. It is my pleasure to introduce to you uh Jerry Kendra, who's gonna tell us about philosophy of math. Yeah. All right, thank you. Unmuted. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, before I get started, let me just preface with, uh, I'm certainly not an expert on this topic, but it's something I just personally enjoy and very interested in. And I know there are some other people who are similarly interested in it. So if after this talk, you wanna learn more, I'm definitely hoping at some point to do a kind of reading group. And I think that this topic is really right for that setting. Um, it's based a lot on essays and those sorts of things. So, you know, just talk to me after. Uh, but if you're like, this is the most boring thing I've ever heard, then don't talk to me. <laughs> um, am I gonna be able to switch? There we go. Wow, that, this didn't render super well, but um, I was hoping to be, let this talk be a conglomeration of a bunch of interesting sources, but this wasn't fun. So it really ended up kind of being a review of this book. Uh, you can't see it very well here, but it's this book. It's Philosophy of Mathematics by Lenevo, I found this book to be a really good synopsis of a lot of the major tenets and ideas in philosophy of math and a good starting place for anybody who's interested. And most of the ideas in my talk were adopted from this book. Um, yeah. So in order to do philosophy of math, we need just the tiniest bit of philosophy background. But before I even get into that, I just want to talk about what is philosophy of math. I think it might even sound like an oxymoron if you say that to the correct person. Because a lot of times when I tell people like I do math, I think what they conjure up in their mind is like I'm an engineer, right? Um, and I certainly don't feel that way. Like I feel a lot more akin to the way philosophers think. And that's certainly partially a result of the fact that I do algebra, right? Like if you do operations research, you probably feel maybe more kindred to engineers than I do. But um it's not, it's certainly not just me that feels this way. I think historically this has been kind of the viewpoint. Um, if you look, I think the, the first thing everybody always looks to is ancient Greece, right? Um, and the mathematics that Plato did and the fundamental things that he did. Um, there's a story which may or may not be true. Um, well, a fact, which may or not, not be fact that uh, above the door of Plato's academy, the entrance it read, let no one ignorant of geometry enter here, uh, which kind of tells you what you need to know. But we don't have to look back as far as ancient Greece to see how philosophy and mathematics or history have been somewhat synonymous. If you look at modern philosophy, and this is like quite a bit of a misnomer. Don't worry, I'm not just going to be talking about like without stuff. Um, this is kind of a misnomer. This is like uh, philosophers from the 16th to 19th century in Europe. Um, we see um, Tons and tons of overlap. Think of, for example, Descartes, um, Leibniz, uh, Pascal, and and very importantly Kant. And he didn't contribute to like proper mathematics in the same way that the other ones did, but he featured very very prominently in philosophy of math proper. Like this book is literally just Kant's philosophy of math. Um, we won't be talking too much about him because that's more on the philosophy side of things, but um. That's all to say that this is, in many ways, a very natural uh, field to, to kind of be thinking about. So the brief philosophy background we're gonna need is just the three main fields of philosophy. This is like the first thing you learn in any philosophy class. So the first of them being epistemology. So this is the branch of philosophy which is concerned with knowledge, 
its nature, its scope. So for us, it's like, what is mathematical knowledge? How do we gain mathematical knowledge? These kind of things. Metaphysics, this is the branch that deals with first principles of things, including abstract concepts such as being, knowing, substance, cause, identity, time, and space. So what do we think about this with respect to, you know, how is math related to physical space? How are they the same? How are they distinct? What are mathematical objects? What is the essence of like their existence? Those kind of questions. And then the last is ethics. Unsurprisingly, this is exactly what you would think philosophy concerned with moral phenomena. This is not going to feature much in this talk. Um, for, the, for a long time, I think math was considered to be amoral, meaning like has no relation to moral phenomena. This, in our modern conceptions of math, is definitely not the case. You think about, you know, stats being more and more incorporated in the ethics of stats and big data and these things, but it's not really going to be important for our talk. These are going to be the main two kind of components. So let's start with some classical conceptions of math. Um, and let's do a little thought experiment. So imagine there's some community in the world that claims to have some amazing kind of knowledge resulting from a discipline of practice there. They claim it has three distinct characteristics. One, it's a priori, which is a fancy way of saying it doesn't rely on sense experience whatsoever. Two, it is concerned with abstract objects. So these are objects that aren't located in time and space, and they don't participate in causal relationships. And three, that it's concerned with truths that are necessary in the sense that things could not have been otherwise, or in the sense that had, you know, the world been different, uh, had there been, say, you know, different physics or different people, like, these truths would have still held regardless, right? So these are three really, really strong and kind of unusual claims uh, if we're trying to develop, say, a science. And these are the three principles which were historically attributed to what's called rational metaphysics. So basically, it's like you are trying to reason about, like, the first principles of the universe, um, just like rationally, kind of directly. And someone might hear that and kind of summarily reject it, right? Just say, okay, you can do this. You can hypothesize about the universe and how it started just in your head. But like this, it doesn't mean anything. It's contentless. It doesn't really have truth. But mathematics uh, also claims, and many people claim that it has these three features as well, um, and mathematics is a lot harder to just kind of summarily reject. Um, this quote I take from Lenevo, he says, by being so different from ordinary empirical sciences, mathematics is physical, philosophically puzzling, but at the same time, it is rock solid. If we, and the, the problem with just kind of rejecting math is it is so intrinsically a part of the science that we do that, um, you're going to have to work really, really hard to say that it's contentless, right? Um, so our job as mathematicians is to do one of two things, to reject some or all of these and give justification for that, which can be harder than you might think, um, or accept them and say, okay, how is it possible to have knowledge of abstract objects? Um, or how if I have a priori knowledge, or how do I come up, what is the process for like gaining this a priori knowledge? You have to integrate these things. And that's a hard question as well. And this is kind of what I'm going to refer to throughout as the integration challenge. Essentially, it's how do we integrate the metaphysics of math, namely what it is with the epistemology, namely how we form mathematical beliefs. So let's go through these one by one, a priori. So uh, the kind of fundamental text for this is Plato's Mino. This is where we first kind of see these explicitly written out. This is, this is a very famous dialogue where Socrates, the main character of this dialogue, he is talking to Mino's slave. And the point is that this person has absolutely no, uh, ma no learning, like no mathematical knowledge, really, like formal learning of any kind. And through like a series of probing questions, uh, Socrates leads him to the conclusion that, the geometric conclusion that the square of a diagonal of a rectangle, uh, sorry, of a square, the square of the diagonal is the sum of the squares of any two sides, right? Which is just basically the Pythagorean theorem, right? Um, if you've ever read this, maybe like me, the first time you read it, you're like screaming at the page, like, because it's just Socrates going like, well, isn't this the case, right? And the guy's like, yes. And then he'll be like, what do you think? And then, and, and then 
the response is like wrong half the time. And then eventually through a bunch of painstaking work, they get to the right conclusion. And then Plato's like, see, he knew it all along. <laughs> right, and so the, and his conclusions are, are twofold. One, we possess innate mathematical concepts, and two, that they're a priori, meaning like they don't rely on sensory experience. And so I'm sitting there, of course, like screaming, it's like, of course he's relying on sensory experience. It's like Socrates is probing him with all these questions. But um, the important distinction is that what Socrates is doing doesn't uh, represent a justification for basically the beliefs that, that are formed. Kant makes this important distinction. Kant is very Platonistic in how he thinks, but he makes a distinction between, um, he basically assents to the fact that all knowledge begins with sensory experience, but importantly, that it is not, um, ooh, what did he say? That it's, uh, it commences with sensory experience, but it, ooh, Right, but it doesn't arise uh, from sensory experience. Basically, his, his response to this is that um, it's our cognitive faculties from which our knowledge arrives, and, and basically the questions are just spurring this process along. An easier way to look at this is like, think about how we learn arithmetic. My wife's an elementary school teacher. She could tell you, like, if you want to teach a kid one plus one, you like, you show them one object, you show them another object, you put them together, and you're like, and this is two. Right? And that's how they learn one plus one. But that's simply to spur an understanding of arithmetic. That's not how we learn all of arithmetic, right? It's like there seems to be some kind of any understanding of what's going on there that's distinct from just like the empirical objects that we're looking at, right? Um, another, another way that we can think about this is like kids seem to have an understanding of the infinite, but like we don't have kind of instantiation of that. So that knowledge has to be innate. Um, so if we do possess innate mathematical knowledge, we are kind of, the people who accept this, they have to answer the question of, okay, how do we gain this knowledge? And this is typically kind of the hard part for people in this position. We saw what Kant said, it's basically like, um, and he agrees with the conception of like our faculty of reason. This seems kind of circular though. We get this from psychology. Plato gives a much stronger, much stranger response. He gives this idea, famous idea called recollection, which is basically a metaphysical response. It's like the soul is immortal. And so being born again, it's seen everything. And when we learn these things, it's just recollection because our soul had already learned them in a previous life. This doesn't really hold water anymore, but it was a very important concept is very important to play this philosophy, but it's not really important to it uh, today. So the opposite view is empiricism, right? This is the belief that all substantive knowledge, meaning like essentially true knowledge, is empirical. So there are two strategies for empiricists, two different strategies. One, you know, they can admit that mathematical knowledge is a priori, but basically say it's not substantive enough to count as a counterexample to empiricism, right? Like it is Maybe a priori, but it's not like true in the same sense that empirical knowledge is. Hume famously makes the distinction that mathematical knowledge concerns, quote, relations of ideas rather than matter of fact. The other option is just reject Platonic idea that mathematical knowledge is a priori. This is harder to do. Um, Mill attempts to do this with his account of arithmetic. I'm not going to go through it at this time, but you know, feel free to ask me about it after. We're going to look at a bit more of a robust version of empiricism which is due to Klein. And it's based around his central contention, which is that most sentences are only indirectly concerned with observation and have consequences concerning the observable only when combined with other sentences. So generally when I'm talking about science, we should think physics. Um, that's generally the best kind of way to be thinking about this. But, um, and that's generally what Klein's talking about as well. So the big idea is that, right, our knowledge, say, of physics, it's like a vast interconnected web. And empiricism, uh, I'll read this, interconnected web on which observation impinges only at the periphery. Throughout this web, beliefs are connected by relevant logical relations. So put in like basic terms, his idea is a lot of the statements of physics don't aren't directly related to like observable fact. A lot of them are formulated like purely analytically, mathematically. 
their mathematical statements. They don't necessarily have to do with physical reality. And he says that these are internal to the kind of fundamental physical physics axioms at the edge. He's like, we need to verify those through em empirically through experience. And then because those are connected to all the internal mathematical theorems, like analytically, when I say analytical, I mean just like kind of through pure logical steps, it's like, then they are also um, acceptable to empiricists as well. It's like the, the, empiric the empirical observations on the edge, they permeate everything. So that's kind of his, uh, and, and that leads into what is called his confirmational holism which is that only science as a whole faces the tribunal of experience, thus the empirical evidence received at the periphery permeates the entire web. So this is how, you know, an empiricist might allow mathematical knowledge to be a priori, but still maybe to be contentful because it's basically inherited from the empirical formulas that is predicated upon. So he has this famous quote, the objects of pure mathematics and theoretical physics are epistemologically on par. So essentially, as like knowledge, they're essentially the same thing. This is a strong statement. So what are some responses to this theorem? First of all, how do you account for the obvious of a lot of mathematics through this, right? For example, our belief that 2 plus 2 equals 4 versus our belief that neutrinos have mass. If math truths, these are things that I think we would all accept to be true. It's hard not to accept 2 plus 2 equals 4, as we'll see as, as true. Um, but the kinds of evidence we use for these two statements are like just completely different, right? Um, so it doesn't really seem that mathematical truths and um, physics truths are epistemologically the same, right? And it doesn't really seem like we need physics or observations to determine the truth of this statement. Um, Another one is that it, another kind of response is that it leaves a great deal of mathematics without epistemological justification, namely those theorems which fail to contribute to empirical science. The idea is, you know, physics uses a lot of math, but there's a ton of very similar math which isn't incorporated directly into physics. So therefore, according to his approach, like it's completely unjustified. The only stuff that's justified is the stuff that's, you know, inside of some empirical science. But you could have other theorems that are on par with these theorems, which aren't, and thus they're left completely like without justification. So are we to think that these theorems are less true than these other ones just because they haven't been incorporated into some empirical science? That would seem to be implication. And then last, mathematical theories play a constitutive role in providing framework for empirical theories. So this is the kind of re response you see a lot when people are trying to get rid of uh, math, certain ideas about math, is that in order to show the theorem, they, they're going to require some math to do it. Namely, like in formulating the empirical theories that he says are on the edge, like in order to do that, most of the time you require at least some um, what we would call fundamental like axioms of math in order to formulate those. One cl uh, classic example from Friedman is like when relativity was, was coming out, was hot and new. Um, it was being confirmed empirically after the theory, but they went through a process, this like tribunal of experience, um, but all of the, you know, mathematic, all the geometry, like the manifolds of that geometry that underlie the theory, didn't go through that same process, right? Like we, we didn't hold it to the same standard that we held the purely like empirical theories. So um, one of the biggest legacies of Quine is what we call the indispensability argument. This is kind of a formalization of something that you probably all thought of at one point. The first premise is by far the most like confusing, so don't, don't worry. But premise one says existential quantifiers incur ontological commitment. That is, for a statement of the form there exists x such that t of x to be true, there must be some object that satisfies the condition. So the basic idea is like if you make a statement which quantify which says, you know, there exists some element with this property, it implies, and if you take this to be true, then you have committed to the existence of an abstract object which has this property, or at least an object, whether it's abstract or not. Um, premise two, natural science makes indispensable use of the theories that quantify over abstract mathematical objects. Premise three, we have reason to believe what natural science tells us. And thus the conclusion is we have reason to believe that there are abstract mathematical objects. So the idea is, you know, 
we justify this purely analytical expression because we use it in empirical sciences and we believe the empirical science is true. So this kind of abstract statement inherits that, that truth. We have reason to believe it's true. And because this statement incurred a commitment to the existence of some mathematical object, the conclusion is that there exists mathematical object. And this is a very formal, obviously, but this kind of reasoning was really important um, to early philosophy of math. Uh, just note that this first premise uh, is Quine's theory of ontological commitment, which is to be is to be the value of a bound variable. So we uh, we now want to get into abstract objects. We've kind of just given one argument for the existence of abstract objects, at least abstract mathematical objects. Um, recall that we're we're going to call an object abstract if it has no location in time and space, and it's causally and efficacious, doesn't take part in causal relations, otherwise it's concrete. So quick question, who here has ever seen a triangle? Nice. nice. <laughs> um, good, good, good. Right. Let me show you something like that, right? Who here has ever seen a circle? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not so sure about that one, right? Why is that? Let's let's kind of talk about it. Um, so abstract objects, right? We break this up into two statements. One we refer to as object realism, which is just there are mathematical objects. The other one is that it's called abstractness, namely mathematical objects are abstract. So we've already shown one argument for object realism, namely the indispensability argument. Um, this is the one that has traditionally been far less controversial, right? Uh, uh, far more controversial. Um, because once you say that mathematical objects exist, it's hard not to say they're it's hard not to say they're abstract, right? Otherwise, our, our whole method of mathematics would seem like completely wrong. Like, why are we not concerned with the location of like the ideals that were if they, if they aren't abstract, I should be like a zoologist. I'd be like, okay, where are my ideals? I need to prove some theorems about abstract algebra, <laughs> right? So this has been the one that's been much harder. This one is generally accepted given this one, right? Uh, Frege is the kind of father of logicism. We'll be talking about him later. He gives a very similar argument. I'm not going to go through the details now, but he plays a very important role. And he staunchly believes that there exists abstract mathematical objects. Um, so the last and kind of stronger claim about abstract objects is called reality. And this is not super well defined, but it says mathematical objects are at least as real as ordinary objects. Kind of weird, um, but we'll get into it in a minute. This is something that Plato famously was a big proponent of. Um, in another one of his dialogues with Phaedo, he gives a an argument that I think should probably be familiar to a lot of us. It goes as follows. We possess perfectly precise mathematical concepts, i.e. a circle. However, these objects are never instantiated in a perfectly precise way in the real world. Thus, our knowledge of them cannot be empirical, but must be innate. So this, I think, is not only a cleaner argument for the, exist for the fact that we have innate knowledge of, of objects, which he was arguing for earlier in his Mino, um, but it gets at this idea of how we think about objects. This is why I, like, why I asked you about this, right? This is not definitely not a triangle. I could probably be persuaded that you've seen a triangle because it's really determined by finitely many points. This is definitely not a circle. And I would also argue that you've never seen a circle, right? Like circles are inherently infinite objects, right? And um, in this case, I'm limited by the amount of chalk I have. And you may argue that there exist instantiations of infinite objects in the real world. We'll talk about that later. I'm not sure but, I've seen a line say, because if you draw something on the chalkboard, that's mostly in space. Right, right. <laughs> but people, you know, people get a lot more offended if I said that wasn't a line. But I, I tend to do it. Um, but that's kind of the idea he's getting at. And this gets at his idea of what he calls the forms which I won't get into too much, but like this is a really big thing for Plato. His idea is that like for every object in the real world, there's like a perfect form of it, which is kind of how we think about math, right? Um, like that we have an idea of a circle. This like gives us an idea of what a circle is and we can define it analytically. 
but we don't, but this, he would just say is like a pale metaphysical shadow of like the perfect, the perfect circle, um, which actually attains like a higher level of, of being than a higher mode of reality. And he does this for everything though, which is kind of where he loses. I think most people is like, there's also the form of a chair. He's like the perfect chair and it exists. And this is what he's talking about recollection. It's like at some point our spirit was like with the forms and then, you know, that's, and we were recollecting our knowledge of the forms. And that's how we have innate knowledge um, of math. And like, I don't want to trivialize Plato because like he did a lot of important stuff, but like, you know, that's probably a lot further than most people want to go. It's so, like, is there any justification for the reality claim outside of this? And the answer is like kind of yes, right? Um, namely, think about the fact that when we do mathematics, um, mathematical truths seem to exist separate, not only from like reality, but from our like our consciousness as well. That's how it seems to be. It's like when you set out to prove a theorem, you work hard, you prove it, or you find a different theorem, I don't think the res response for most of us is like, I created this theorem. It seems like it was like there waiting for you, right, to be discovered. And Frege uh, compares mathematicians in this way to geographers, right? It's like, just as the geographer does not create a C when he draws borderlines, the mathematician cannot properly create anything with his definition, right? So these three ideas combined in conjunction, uh, abstractness, uh, mathematical objects, and um, sorry, realism and reality, um, sorry, object realism, abstractness, and reality in conjunction are known in philosophy math as Platonism, lowercase p. Uppercase p means basically anything that Plato said or thought. Um, but yeah, of course, there are people who disagree with this. They're called nominalists. So nominalism is the view that there are no ob abstract objects. So how do we kind of fight for this? Uh, Paul Benacerif is kind of the, the forefather of this. I'm not going to get deeply into his viewpoint. But basically, he thinks it's a problem because if they're abstract objects and we also want to basically do math with them, then he believes that there must be a causal connection between basically the things that we know and the knower. But this is problematic if we're saying that they're, that these mathematical objects are abstract, right? Because they don't participate in causal relationships. This is kind of a version of what I referred to really as the integration problem. And I think that this is a very reasonable kind of uh, critique, but we're not getting into because instead of what I want to talk about field strategy for nominalizing science um, is a bit easier to grasp. So Archer Field said the only serious argument for Platonism depends on the fact that mathematics is applied outside of math. So his idea is like if we can show math isn't indispensable to physics, then we can uh, get rid of the silly idea that there are abstract objects. So as a motivating example, consider how he nom nominalizes finite number descriptions. So instead of writing the number of x such that f of x equals 1, this is kind of the Platonistic way. Um, number description just essentially means a numeral. And this is an abstract object. So they want to, like, they need to get rid of this if you want to. Uh, so in order to nominalize it, he says, we'll define this instead purely analytically as um, there exists x such that for any y, it, f of y if and only if x equals y. So this is kind of the way of defining one without ab abstract objects, right? It's, and it seems like we're kind of bending over backwards to do this a little bit. Um, and the problem is this becomes completely untenable as we get more complex than literally defining the number one. This just becomes so, so, so hard to do with like pure analytic uh, symbols. So he uses what he calls bridge principles to make a quote Platonistic detour through finite number descriptions. So his idea is like, if I can show that I can define um, basically number descriptions nominally, then I can use this as like a shorthand to prove a lot of stuff, but I can it's like consistent because I've already shown that I can construct them without abstract objects. So this is kind of his strategy. He's like, I'm gonna nominalize every scientific theory by showing that it can be reformulated in a way that avoids commitment to abstract objects. And I'm going to show that any Platonistic theory used is conservative over the nominalist one. Meaning, if I can prove something with the Platonistic theory I use, I need to show I can also prove it nominally. But it's just a lot easier to prove it with the Plato, uh, Platonistic constructions. So famously, he did this for a lot of stuff. But he tried to do this for New Newton's theory of gravity, just stated as follows. So if we want to do this, 
We're going to need two ideas principally, one, an idea of distance, and two, an idea of mass. So before I get into this, let's talk about synthetic versus analytic geometry. This is very, um, so synthetic geometry studies figures as such without recourse to formulate. What this means is like, this is what we did for like 2,000 years. Ever since Euclid, this was how we did geometry. We thought about geometry as like the same as physical space. And if you wanted to think about a triangle, you think about like a physical triangle in the real world, or you construct one. You would literally like draw one. Um, but then with Descartes, we get analytic geometry, which uses formulas and coordinate systems as opposed to just thinking about these objects as in physical space. So like instead we might define triangle with vertices 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0. Um, but of course that's offensive to our nominalist friends because those are all abstract notions and abstract objects. So field needs to find a way to use synthetic geometry to formulate this theorem. And his normalization of space basically goes like this. There's an isomorphism f from the set E of partial points to the set R3 of coordinates. Thus, f is one to one and onto. Uh, of course, just saying there's an isomorphism and then thus it's one to one and onto is kind of problematic, right? Um, it's like A, therefore A. Now, of course, he's more robust than this, but you know this is how it's summarized in many places. Uh, and for every x, y, and z, and w, we get the following. So I need to explain this notation, right? So what this is saying, he defines nominally some notions, namely, I just want to put z, x, y, z. Um, I don't know why I'm rewriting this either, because they're already up there. Right. Um, it's probably because how I did it. Before. But I'm not, don't even worry about those. I don't know why I drew them. This was his nominal way of talking about basically b of x, y, z, if and only if y is between x and z. And he's thinking about physical space, right? So y is like basically on a, exists on a line that we can construct between uh, x and z. That's what this means. And then this means that the distance from x to y is the distance from z to w. And this Neither of these really require abstract objects to think about in physical space, right? It's then the jump, though, to say that, and with these constructions, it's like physical space, you know, is the same as R3, like constructed analytically. That's kind of the jump that all of this is saying. And if you know history math, you know that's a fairly problematic contention. He does the same thing with mass, which I think is definitely less problematic. He's like, instead of thinking about mass, arbitrarily, you pick like a unit, like the kilogram. There's an actual physical kilogram. It's like, and everything is compared to that. It's like you say, um, and it's easy to say like the mass of X is less or equal to the mass of Y nominally, because like you can literally just think about them as, as physical objects. And so he does this for all the theorems of gravity. And then he concludes, okay, I've nominalized gravity. And he tries to do this for all scientific theories. And of course, this is like, awfully hard and a lot of work. So, you know, props to him. But we definitely have some problems with this. Number one, field assumes that there are completely arbitrary regions of space. That is, every set of real coordinates defines a region. So this is what he's saying, that, that first thing, nominalizing space, he's saying, you know, R3 is the same as, like, our physical space. And that's a very problematic contention. Um, namely, how do you show that like all of the different exotic things that we can construct in R3 are possible to be realized in physical space? Like, think about even in one dimension, if you're familiar with Cantor's dust, this is like a very, very exotic construction of a set that has measure zero, but um, uncountably many elements. It's like, okay, now I'm like that. Like, <laughs> that'll be hard. And then similarly, it's like, there are other fields of physics that seem completely hopeless, like, uh, Quantum, mechanic make, quantum mechanics makes use of Hilbert spaces um, with infinite dimensional vector spaces. Once again, problematic. It's going to be a lot harder to, to do this process. And then the last, Fields nominalism seems to conflict with the naturalism that motivates its view. So this requires a little explanation. Naturalism essentially tries to minimize the differences between natural science and philosophy, right? And so if we find, we, we see extant physics as being very effective and very useful. So a naturalist should, you know, 
support physics at should you would expect them to support physics as we find it because it's very good at explaining a lot of phenomena but as we find physics it is like saturated with all of these kind of exotic abstract mathematical notions so it's like is there sufficient reason that feel uh feels to try to like extricate math from physics it seems like contradictory with the thing that motivates his viewpoint about uh in the first place so that's definitely a more kind of philosophical response but so the last thing that we're going to talk about is necessity so we're doing this through this kind of fun question is mathematics the same in every conceivable universe this is something you hear a lot it's kind of a fun like philosophy of math question right so we need to break math down a little bit so mathematics and physics what do we what do we think I see you know, I see you know, like, yeah, no, right? Let's look at the thing he just tried to nominalize. Um, theory of gravity. It says, so G is a constant, these are masses, this is the distance. It says that the force due to gravity between two objects is inversely proportional to the distance between them squared. I can certainly imagine a universe where the force due to gravity is inversely proportional to the uh, distance cubed or to the distance or to the square, like, that's not harmful to like my, um intuition right it's like there's no reason that it seems like it had to be this way so like physics like empirical physics seems to be out so what about pure math it's not very clear what i mean by that right we have to be careful because there are a lot of theorems that when we learn them they seem like oh of course this would be true for example in algebra um we have this theorem that given uh, i should probably say a commutative ring with one and a proper ideal I contained it properly contained in R, I is contained in some maximal ideal M. Yeah, actually, I should put commuted to bring the point, but don't worry about it too much. This seems intuitive. If you know what ideals are and you know what a ring is, to take like a proper ideal and say, well, it's like if it's not maximal, like then there's another ideal over it, and we can keep doing that until we hit a maximal one before we hit like seems very intuitive, but this is you know very contentious because it relies on an axiom that if you didn't know about it, we'll be talking about it later. Like this would just seem intuitive, but it's, but it's not, or at least necessary. And then the real numbers, like we talk about these since middle school, it's like the real numbers are like, you know, you learn about square root of two and you're like, so there are rational, integers, rational numbers, and there are real numbers, which is like everything in between, like square root of two and all. And you're like, yay, when you're done, that's all the numbers. But it's like, then you come to realize that like the way that these are constructed, although certainly the most intuitive way, I would say, is not by any means necessary. There are a lot of ways we can analytically like extend the rationals, for example, the p-addicts. So this doesn't seem like a necessary construction. It wouldn't be something we take as like an axiom. Right? So what about arithmetic? Can you guys imagine a world where two plus two equals one or where all of my students actually know how to do math, <laughs> um, <laughs> right? I can. <laughs> and of course, this is a very pedantic response to this question, right? Um, and it's not exactly a problem, but it underlies the important and important concept, which is we need to be very clear about what our objects are um, and about what the relevant axioms are. But in reality, if I'm talking about like, these representing the natural number two and the natural number two, I have a hard time imagining a universe where I take think of the empirical point of view. You take two objects, you put them into a group with two other objects, and you get like one now. That hurts my my sensibilities. So what about logic? It seems we've definitely hit rock bottom here, right? <laughs> Can you imagine a world where A and not A? No, <laughs> probably not. Um, so in some sense, logic and arithmetic are the rock bottom of mathematics, along with some geometry as well. But so Frege talks about this. Um, he talks about the domains of various that various kinds of truth govern. So according to him, logical and arithmetical truths govern quote the widest domain of all, for to it belong not only the actual, not only the intuitable, but everything thinkable. And so the natural question would be. How far can we get with logic alone? How much of math do we derive? And logicism claims that our knowledge of mathematical theorems is grounded fully in logical demonstrations, or basic logical truths. So the greatest proponent of this is Frege. He started his career during what was called the rigorization of analysis. 
Um, this was first introduced by Balzano. As a motivating example, we think about the intermediate value theorem. Initially, this was done pretty much just by intuition and synthetically, like you take a function and you would literally construct it. So f of a to f of b, pick a point in the middle. And intuitively, the theorem says at some point between here and here, the line, this line must intersect this line. And that's how it would have been constructed for 2000 years after Euclid, right? But the problem is that it relies on a lot of intuition and not a like very specified axiom. So Balzano was like, let's not do that. Uh, and from that, we get this, the epsilon delta notion that is so useful in analysis. And he's trying to do that basically for all of analysis to get rid of the, just like intuition and, and make sure that everything follows from like pure, nice, specified um, and accepted proof techniques. So Frege made two significant contributions to this. Most importantly, he invented the first ever formal language. His uh, mm, Begriffschrift uh, or conceptual writing. Um, and the idea is to take this even further. He's like, to make sure that, you know, we, we take our axioms and when we prove theorems that intuition never slips in unnoticed, it's like, we need to have a formal system of like, what is, what are we allowed to do? And he wants it to be like all analytic. So all like basically structured in the language of logic. He's like, we have our axioms and now we have this formal system which tells us these are the steps that are allowed and these are the ones that aren't so that we're not relying on intuition. Right? And the other thing was his analysis of number descriptions. We could just think about these as numerals, right? He was a firm believer that these were abstract objects. And he um, famously made one of the first uh, logical constructions of them. You can find a lot of these. Um, I was hoping to talk about them a little bit, but I really can't. So I'm going to go ahead to Frege's theorem. Frege's theorem states arithmetic is reducible to pure logic. This is kind of his his whole bag, like this is his thing, right? So what do I mean by arithmetic? I mean, he means second order Pino, Dedekind Pino arithmetic. So these were like the first sets of like formal rules for arithmetic that were ever set down in the 1880s by Dedekind and Pino. Um, and basically in order for Frege to be successful, he's got to take any of the non-analytic things in here and make them analytic, or essentially the things that aren't purely logical statements and somehow write them logically. So for example, like this statement is that there exists the number zero. That's not purely logical. So uh, as an example, to internalize that to logic, he defines zero as the number of x such that x is not equal to x. This is stated all in terms of his like formal language. Um, so is he successful in doing this? Unfortunately, in his construction, he uses something called Hume's principle, which Basically, everyone's like, this is not purely analytic. And he tries really hard to reconcile this, but he's unable to. And he eventually kind of abandons this. So maybe we could like breathe a sigh of relief that our, all of our jobs aren't just like, could be done by philosophers who teach symbolic logic. <laughs> um, but the other thing is like, Dedekind Pino arithmetic does not get you like that much as far as like what you like abstract math. Like you couldn't get that far with this anyway. But um, Frege's legacy is cemented in his construction of that first axiomatic system, that first formal system. That is huge. That is probably the biggest contribution to proof theory, the axiomatic theory since Euclid. And so to take that idea a little further, we have what's called formalism. And now we're moving on from just these ideas of what math is to like how we ought to do math. So formalism is the belief that mathematics can be reduced to rules for manipulating formulas without any reference to meaning of the formulas. So the strongest version of this is game formalism, which is that mathematics revolves around formal systems, which are syntactical games played with meaningless expressions. Okay? So this is kind of a natural thing that a cynical person about math would think, right? And, and game formalism, it, it's often compared to chess. It's like, it's like if math is no different than chess. They're arbitrary rules, and you follow them, and you get theorems, you get like results, but they don't mean anything. Uh, and now, this is building on Frege's notion of a formal system, but he is, was kind of appalled at this notion. He did not believe that math was not contentful. He would not say that um, at all. He thought math was, was contentful and had meaning. Um, this is kind of a straw man though. Um, game formalism 
most people can would kind of summarily reject this, but there are there are some more compli complex versions of deductivism, which uh, I'm sorry, uh, formalism. One of them being deductivism. This is sometimes referred to as if-thenism. It's the point of view that pure math is the investigation of deductive consequences of arbitrarily chosen sets of axioms in a, some formal, uninterpreted language. Best way to think about this is with an example, and this is kind of very akin to like this is this is like algebra people's dreams, right? So let's look at this this table here. is It's a Cayley table. It represents a finite group called the Klein four group, and it essentially tells us how all the four elements in there interact with one another. Okay, now this is representing all of the ways that we can, all the operations we can do on a water molecule so that what we end up with is symmetric. So this is called molecular symmetry. It's a big thing in chemistry. But the idea is, right, you can rotate the molecule. And these are actually like three-dimensional things. But if you rotate the molecule 180 degrees and it would be symmetric, like it would look the same. You can flip it in the, this plane that the molecule is in. You can flip it, reflect it over the axis perpendicular to that one, and it would be symmetric. Or you can do what? What other option? Nothing. Nothing, right? We do nothing. So those are the four kind of symmetries on the water molecule. And it can be shown that the way that these are related to one another is exactly the same way that these elements in this abstract are related to one another. And in that sense, we would call these two structures isomorphic, clearly coming from the same structure, right? And so the idea is that they share an abstract or general structure, but they differ in their realizations. One of them is clearly abstract, one of them is concrete. So the idea um, that formalist proposes, we have this nice, um, what they call, um, What's wrong with me? Division of labor, right? It's like, because these are isomorphic, everything I prove, all the theorems I prove about this are also going to be theorems about this. So I can do everything in the abstract, and then every time I find a realization of it, I already know like everything about it, right? So if I wanted to ask, do these operations commute? Namely, it's like, if I do one thing and then the other, and I do the same things but in opposite order, am I going to get up, end up with the same thing? Well, it's like, instead of having to like, do this with the water molecule and empirically, we can just notice, oh, the Klein four group, sorry, I'm gonna lose a couple of you here. It's isomorphic to Z2 cross Z2. It, it, it has exponent two, therefore it's abelian. That's the theorem that we have about groups. So I know, yes, all of these operations commute. If I flip in this axis, then in this axis, it's the same as flipping in this axis, then in this axis. So if I rotate and flip and flip and rotate, I'm gonna get the same thing. And I don't actually have to like look at the water molecule to, to know that once I've established this isomorphism. So I'm not going to go through the second example. We don't have time, unfortunately. But basically, the conclusion of deductivism is that pure mathematics studies which theorems fall deductively from various axiomatic theories, and some appropriate empirical science studies which abstract structures are approximately realized in various systems that interest us. So this seems very appealing, especially to me as an algebraist. But you know, we do need to. But the one problem is it seems to take a good idea a little bit too far, insofar as it becomes a bit reductionist. Uh, Hilary Putnam, not the Putnam from the Putnam exam, that's William Putnam, um, said, the essential business of pure mathematics may be viewed as deriving logical consequences from sets of axioms. And this just seems to be like a bit of a minimization of mathematics. Um, so the main problem with this is that in addition to structural axioms, we need some kind of foundational axioms. We need like a safe place from which to do the rest of math. Like we need some contemptful mathematics, what most people would say, in order to like decide what's a good axiom, what's a bad axiom. And we get the same kind of problem um, when we talk about what, which we're going to refer to as the problem of model existence, which goes as follows. It's like one good way to show that a formal system's in good standing is actually to like construct an example. But to construct an example, once again, you're going to need some initial like axioms or to do this and also like if you wanted it's like can you one, one response would be that oh we just look for examples in the real world but we've kind of already talked about how that's problematic as well so um we're getting close to the end here don't worry um so we come to this question of like what are the right axioms for a good formal system so one good thing to look at is like euclid's postulates for geometry like 
For 2,000 years, these were, these were gospel. And after 2,000 years in the 1830s, a bunch of people started saying, eh, this one, right? And when we relaxed it, we found a lot of very useful, very good mathematics. Um, so first of all, it comes to the question of really asking, what are the fundamental axioms that we're going to take, right? Another thing that we'd really like a formal system to have is something called completeness. So a formal system F is said to be complete if every statement of the language F is either a statement or its negation. Uh, either its statement or its negation can be derived, i.e. for inconsistent. So it's basically like you give me a formal system and I can, if, I, if there's a statement that's like well-formed in your formal system, it should be provable or its negation should be true. I should be able to prove it's true or not true, ideally. That's what completeness is about. So before we get into like the last thing, I'm gonna kind of set the stage. <clears throat> For the longest time, infinity was considered to be only potential. Like look at the integers, like we never thought, uh, people never thought about the integers as a totality, but only as potentially infinite, in the sense that for every integer, you know, there's a next one. And then Cantor came along and he was like, no, um, <laughs> I'm gonna think about infinite sets as a totality. And for the longest time, this was really problematic because of something called Galileo's paradox. So clearly we've been thinking about these things for a long time. Because he said, assume, you know, we can think about this as a set. Well, then I can pair up I can pair up the integers with this subset of the integers, namely all the squares. But this is properly contained in here, which is absurd. So we can't think about total infinite totalities because we get this contradiction. And that goes back to Euclid. It's this idea, this idea that a proper like subset of thing can never be equal to the entire thing. And so they, for the longest time, this was not allowed. But Cantor just said, actually, I'm just gonna allow this relationship to define the size of my set. So he defines the cardin two sets that have the same cardinality, just in case they can be put into one-to-one -one relationship with one another, right? And he takes this even further, upsetting all of the religious folk of the time and people who, and all the finitists, and says, there are actually infinitely many infinities. This is his famous theorem. It says, for any set, the power set, P of A, has more members than A itself. So like, you give me a set, the power set is all the subsets, He's like, even in the infinite case, this is going to be a larger set. So we have a larger infinite cardinality. And the proof of this is super cool. I don't have time to do it. Um, but then, you know, you get this problem. You get a bunch of paradoxes start popping up. The most important of them being Russell's paradox. He says, consider the set of sets not containing themselves. And then once you've defined this, it's pretty easy to derive R is an R if and only if R is not one. Uh, that's not great, right? So... Um, this is kind of the stage uh, for, this happens in the late 19th century, and then we have like kind of a boom of like people responding to this in the early uh, 1900s, right? Um, and before I get into that, I want to define the, uh, something called consistency, which is also something we definitely want. So a formal system is called consistent if there's no theorem B such that both B and not B are provable, right? Shouldn't be able to prove that it's something true and not true in my system. That would be bad. So on the stage steps Hilbert, and Hilbert was a very devoted finitist, right? He did not believe in these new techniques. It's like, I do not believe in your new infinite math. Um, and he says, like, there aren't any realizations of the infinite in physical space or otherwise. In physics, he's like, we already kind of adjudicated this. He's like, no, no. And then in pure math, he's like, all the constructions are purely caught up in this set theory that's clearly full of paradoxes, it's problematic, can't do it, right? So he's like, don't like it, we're not going to do it. Um, and he draws his motivation for the elimination of the infinitesimal from calculus. This is very interesting. This is like the original notion of a limit. And we let delta be like an infinitesimal. It's like, it's not zero, but it's smaller than anything positive, which is like a useful heuristic, but like really problematic in this sense. So it's like, look, you have this construction where you normally see a limit out here, not yet. And then, you know, you, you do this, you foil, which any of my students, of course, this would be a squared plus delta squared, uh, and then this wouldn't work. But then these cancel, and here's the problem. Look at this step. We cancel out the deltas, right? So we're treating delta like it's not zero. And then we're like, actually, just kidding, delta is zero. So 2a plus delta is 2a. And so taking a you know, cue from this, Hilbert 
Uh, it says, just as in the process, the Linux processes of infinitesimal calculus, the infinite, in the sense of infinitely large and infinitely small, prove to be merely figures of speech, so too we realize that the infinite, in the sense of infinite totality, where it's still fine, where we still find it used in deductive methods, is an illusion. Right? So clearly, Hilbert hates, like, Cantor's stuff, right? <laughs> what the heck is this? <laughs> no, right? He says, no one shall drive us out of the paradise that Cantor created for us. How can we reconcile these two things, right? So Cantor's living in the early 1900s. Principia Mathematica just came out, and people are like, yes, math is like unified. Russell and Whitehead, they did it. And, and Hilbert's like, no. It gets caught up in all this problematic set theory. Um, and he also realizes this other problem with it. He's like, it's, they're saying it's consistent, but they're using the system itself to prove its consistency. It's like, that's bad. Let's definitely not do that. So he's like, I'm going to do it better, but um, I'm only going to use finite methods. So this is his idea. It's like, infinitary mathematics need not be contemptible to be justified. Like, he's a formalist. He's like, this infinite math, it's not really true, but like it's useful, so we'll keep it. Like it's fun. Um, so he has this idea of like ideal elements. So think about the addition of like the square root of negative one. He's like, this is like a useful fiction, is what he calls it. He's like, it's very useful. It's not like real. Like it doesn't mean it. Like literally, I guess in this case, right? It's not real. Um, he's like, it doesn't mean anything, but like it's useful. So his goal is the methods of infinite mathematics are justified if we can use contentful finitary mathematics to show their consistency, right? So we're only, he has this like, he says, uh, Principia Mathematica is pulling itself up by its bootstraps by trying to prove its own consistency. He's like, we're gonna do that, but like, it's not gonna be as bad because we're just gonna use finite methods. And he has like reasons to be optimistic for this. Um, so this is the idea. It's like, there's just one condition connected with the method of ideal elements. That is, a proof of consistency for the extension of a domain by the addition of ideal elements is legitimate if and only if that extension does not cause contradiction to appear in the old narrow domain. So basically the idea is like, all right, finite mathematics is cool, it's contentful, it's like nice, um, and it's true. So if I add infinite math on top of that, and I can show that it doesn't create any contradiction in the, like, the original math, then I can show it's consistent and like, we can use it and it like inherits the consistency from the finite math. That's the idea, right? It is if, if like I have this whole thing with infinite math and I pick out all the infinite theorems, it shouldn't create contradiction down below and like the, the, the good stuff. So yeah, yeah, we all know <laughs> what happens next, right? <laughs> Gerdo come along, comes along and ruins all of the fun. So first inconsistency, incompleteness theorem. This is due to Gerdo. It says any consistent formal system F in which a certain amount of elementary arithmetic can be carried out is incomplete. That is our statements about the language F, which can neither be proved nor disproved in F. So that sucks, right? It's like, I want to bring math all under one roof. I want to be able to prove everything in my formal system, but um, Gerdel says any system worth its salt, you cannot do this. Where a certain amount of elementary arithmetic, that is a very, very weak condition. It's like weak form of peanut arithmetic. It's like, if you want to do any math, this is going to hold. So it's like, there are going to be statements you can't prove. For example, Cantor's continued hypothesis. This is, I'm very, very close to being done. This is his uh, hypothesis that there's no cardinality between that of the integers and that of the reals, right? Um, he was unable to prove this, but he's like feeling very confident that it's true. Turns out that under our modern axioms, like this is provably unprovable. <laughs> Which, if that's not the most like philosophy of math thing ever, it's like you can prove that this statement is unprovable, but it is. It's what we call indeterminable. It's like so. Hilbert's like, oh dang, that sucks. But you know what? Let's just keep going. Yeah, <laughs> you know. And then, like, the really bad stuff. <laughs> so let f be as above. F cannot prove its own consistency, and you know, implosion. Right. His whole thing was like this epistemological bargain. He's like, I'm going to get infinitary mathematics for the epistemological price of finite mathematics. And it's going to be great. I'm going to use finite math to prove that the consistency of this larger domain. And then Gerdel comes along and he's like, not only can you not do that, but your finite math can't even prove its own consistency. Right. And there are kind of two responses to this. The intuitionist response is very interesting, but I'm not going to get into it. 
The other, um, but the idea is basically we develop finite map as much as we can. We live within our means. Um, but all hope is not lost. Um, basically, one kind of thing that's not so terrible about this is like systems can prove the consistency of other systems. If your system that you have is consistent, it can be used to prove the consistency of another system. And they can maybe have different forms of legit, like legitimacy. Like one might be legitimate based on empirical like results. And you might say, okay, I think this is consistent because of this evidence. And you might be able to use that to prove consistency of another system. But basically this leaves us where we are today. And the Zermelo Frankel axioms. This is basically the attempt to free set theory from paradoxes. And it's certainly the most common foundation of uh, mathematics today. For example, here are two of the eight typical axioms. Um, this one's called regularity. So for every non-empty set X contains a member Y, such that X and Y are independent sets. So um, their intersection is trivial. And it's kind of confusing, you know, I think about sets within sets, but this is like to avoid Russell's paradox, right? That these two together, that's kind of what they do. It's like, this stops us from having sets that contain themselves, right? Um, and so today, uh, most of, us takes ZF as like our starting point. Um, it includes eight axioms in the optional edition of the somewhat problematic axiom of choice, which of course I use like all the time. Um, and if you want to know how deep like philosophy of math goes, all right, ZF has eight original axioms. This is the last thing I'm going to say. Has eight original axioms and then like maybe one additional one. It's like this book is literally just about that last one um, and like equivalent conceptions of the axiom of choice and they just go on and they go on and they go on um but it's also super super interesting so this is kind of where we're left off um in not in hilbert's paradise but unfortunately in girdle's like i don't know what we want to call it but it's not a paradise so <laughs> we certainly have to have some trade-offs so some great resources if any of this is interesting to you i recommend philosophy of math which is a lot of what this came from GEB, this book is like nothing you've probably ever read. This is like very different in the sense of like, please come talk to me about this book. Like it's like a magnum opus. It is like nothing you've ever read. If like the cool like examples and constructions in here like appeal to you, which there weren't that many, but like that's what this whole book is. It's like unreal, right? Um, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy is fantastic. It is just full of like, you can find any of this stuff. If you, um, that's like a great place to start. Just or like look up definitions and like the different schools of thought. And then this, you can come up and look at it. I think it's a good collection of um, essays, like fundamental essays and readings in philosophy and math, put together by Ben Asera from Putnam, who actually featured uh, in this talk. But yeah, uh, thank you. I know I went two minutes over, but I really appreciate your attention. And uh, yeah, that's it. Questions? Yeah. Oh, in the global theorems, what's the meaning of uh, a sufficient amount of arithmetics? Right. That's a great question, right? Because it's not too well defined. So basically, what you need is like a weak form of Peano arithmetic, dedicated Peano arithmetic, which this is actually kind of a stronger form that I talked about here. We only need the first one. Yeah, essentially. Um, but essentially, once you can do like a very basic level of arithmetic, then Girdle Sams kicks in. And as I kind of mentioned before, this doesn't get you anywhere near the math that we all do. Like, um, it, it is certainly not enough to get all of like the math that we would consider contentful. Um, but yeah, that, that's what he means. It's like some version of this dedicated you know, arithmetic, which is kind of like analytic construction of uh, or other questions. In the Golden theorem, uh, you don't need also that every statement can be uh, one can tell is that a statement belongs to the set of axioms in a finite uh, amount of, of steps. Uh, or like like a verification algorithm for whether the statement is actually like a statement. Well, in the way that I I have stated it here, it's like it kind of precludes that because it's like um, assuming you have that or like I think it's kind of implicit. It's like assuming you have something that is a statement. Then you know this, um, but yeah, that is certain. Like that's certainly an aspect of it. It like Girl's theorem is something you there are like 
bunch of books like this on it. It uses these very weird, like, not weird, but like ways of turning like any statement into like this very formal language, uh, which you're probably familiar with. And it, it is very, very kind of difficult to grasp, but, but that's a great question. You know, I think that like, you know, mathematics, I think it's a very abstract kind of thing. But, you know, we derive things from the action, but the actions in a certain sense are based on our experiences. Right. So, I mean, I believe that if we're in a completely physically different universe, but you give them the ZFC, and I do it choose to conclude C, if you give them those actions, then you derive the same mathematics, right? And in fact, maybe there are some, you know, so for example, if you were talking about the inverse square law, if that doesn't work, if it's like one over R to the four, right, then the stars don't shine and the universe is survivable. Right, so maybe there's more common axiom systems that come from the uh, life forms that are living maybe survival we, universe. Maybe we find it that way because that's what's necessary for right. you know, conscious life to exist. That's right. But it doesn't seem necessary like for math to exist, right? That's the same like, idea. Is like we we kind of think math exists without us, right? Like I, that's what I think certainly. But you know that's one of contention for a lot of people. So. Yeah. Other questions. So, do you believe that mathematician is like an uh, idealist? So, can you kind of specify idealist a little bit? Mm -hmm. uh, it's like idealist in the sense of teacher, but there is something that exists in the, our idea exists without the, any physical experience. Right? We have. Yeah, I'm like relatively platonistic, like in that sense. Like, I think. Um, And our ideas just be as concrete as the universe, right? If it weren't for you know the biological development of my brain, I would have had these ideas. If you throw enough dark matter in the universe, maybe we'll all go into a black hole and the universe won't even be real. So there you go. Yeah. I'll say I think that like mathematical like construction, and this gets into intuitionism, which is like the idea that all of our essentially mental like construction, which I didn't get to talk about, but it's like super interesting. Um I, I certainly believe in like abstractness and object realism. But like I don't, I don't take it as far as Plato to think like circles exist in some other like plane. But I do certainly think that like the the circle itself, like the perfect circle, like is has like some level of like reality, um, even though I can't really like construct it here for you. I don't know if that gets at your question. Uh, maybe you can explain to me exactly better. But um, that's what I got. Please stop talking. <laughs> yeah, isn't so with the incompleteness theorem? I thought I think it was Turing that ended up proving something along the lines of right. We can't. Not only are there statements which are improvable, right? So not only is our is our formal system incomplete, but also we can't know which statements are improvable. So yeah, how, is, how does that relate to what you said about um, right that that the continuum hypothesis is provably unprovable? Like where where does that fit into Turing's result? Right. Um, Turing certainly did like a lot of work in this field. Like look up his like the Church Turing thesis. It's very interesting. Um, but right, you can look up a proof basically that um, where is it? You can basically look up a proof that the continuum hypothesis is indeterminable in ZF. Um, as far as the statement, I know like what you're referring to, the bit, the, like the idea is right. Um, there are going to be statements that always, right? It seems like this would be true, but like there are always going to be statements where you can't even determine if they're provable or if they're not, which is like an even another like step of abstraction. Right, it's like there are proofs, statements that we know we can't prove. There are also statements that we don't know if we can prove them, and we don't know if we can't prove them, which seems kind of contradictory. Sounds like my research program. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, um, like it seems kind of contradictory in a sense. Like, um, how could we know that it's not? How could we know this without uh, knowing that it's not provable in the first place? Like, right? Um, I. I, I can't really speak to it though beyond that. Like, 
where that comes from. I need to certainly internalize these more because their, their construction is like so unbelievably complicated, right? Um, so I, I don't have a super good answer to that. Uh, and I've seen many talks, you know, it's kind of cool when you have these things that are independent of the axioms. Well, now you can just make your new mathematics by throwing them in. And I, if I had a nickel for every time I've seen some talk, and it's like, okay, this works if we assume the generalized continuum hypothesis or something like this, right? I was told, uh, I'm not sure exactly how this works, but I thought it was unbelievably interesting. It was, uh, Freeman Sawyer told me about this, so I'm gonna have to ask him. But he said there was a, there was a paper that, Basically, it had a theorem it wanted to prove, but it relied, but it it seemed, but apparently it must not have. It seemed to rely on the um, zeta. Um, sorry, what am I trying to say? What's the Riemann zeta, the Riemann data uh, function? The, the, the Riemann hypothesis. I, I like. I kept thinking zeta, but it's not part of it. The <laughs> Riemann hypothesis is like. So they assumed the Riemann hypothesis and they proved was true, and they proved it, and they proved it, and then they assumed it was false. And they proved it, which I guess shows that it's like independent of this being true or false. But it's like that's kind of wild, right? Like to, as a proof technique, it's like assume this is true, <laughs> and I'm somehow going to use that to prove it. Assume it's false. I'm trying to use that. We're doing any cases? <laughs> <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so, so it's like wild, which, like I said, I guess shows it was independent after all. I guess it looked like it was tangled up, and so in order to show it, it was independent, they're like, we're just gonna we're gonna do it all. And we'll get two papers. No, I think it's probably one paper. Yeah, but if the Riemann hypothesis is true, maybe the person did that right that way. But then if, if the Riemann hypothesis is true, and then you assume it's false, you start with the false premise. So you should be able to prove it that way as well, right? You prove anything, right? That's right. <laughs> At least one of these groups has concept. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank Jared. I really appreciate you all coming out. And like, if you want to talk about any of this stuff, ideas, or these books, and you want to just peruse them, they're up, they're up here. I've got a bunch of stuff related to philosophy of math. And remember the rule of math club. Things has got to be done. So I'm going to eat some of those. Take it home. <laughs> <laughs>